Good evening, everybody. It is now 6.30, and in order to get everybody uh, get through all of our announcements and programs and activities, we probably need to get started. So if you'd come on over and get seated, I'd appreciate it. Come on over and take a seat, everybody. We'd appreciate it if you can do that now. Yeah, you're supposed to. Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome to the June edition of Quad A. Uh, I'm Blair Kaufman. I'm the president of Quad A. And um, so I think we got a great meeting for tonight. Uh, we've got uh, some, I think, exciting things going on with our friend Will Maynard, so I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, first of all, uh, any new members that we've got tonight? Do we have any new members? Anybody? Of course, we, we certainly probably do need to have Taylor here, and I haven't gotten an announcement from her about any new members, but I think we do have a couple. If there were... At our board meeting, there were a couple meeting, um, new board mem our new um, members that were announced. So I know we're growing and continuing to grow. Uh, I do believe we may have a new balloon in the community here. And <laughs> who would that be, Vanna? Come on, give us a give us a report on the new balloon, Anne. Yes. Quickly, oh Anne, the new balloon. You, you, it's your job now. Oh, I did not know my job. Yeah, you're not doing your job. Hey, Karen. Anyhow, and I'll, I gotta tell you, I am so. Because her other balloon was Shadow Play. Yeah. And I'm, I'm. So I'm so happy to have her get her new balloon because mine is next in line at head balloons. So I, I finally got a photograph today of a couple of ladies sewing fabric that kind of looked like my balloon. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any new pilots and new ratings? Anybody that's here tonight? I, I do will tell you that if anybody knows my student, um, Derek Graspaugh, he got his commercial license uh, two weekends ago, so Derek Graspaugh got his commercial, so I can, uh, I'm finally done with it uh, as his instructor, but he did extremely well. And let's see, anybody have information other than community relations about ballooning in the community that we need to take care of? No? Nope. Okay. All right, then. Uh, tonight, we have, a, I think, a really instructional program for everybody and things that are, uh, uh, you, may, you may never see, but then when it does come, you better be ready for, uh, for a CPR kind of an experience because one of your crew members, you, my friend, Doug Len Lenberg, had a problem and he went through CPR as he was coming in for a landing. So things like that do happen. Uh, and, and we need to be ready for those kinds of things. So Will Manus, are you ready? No. Oh, uh, you will be. Yeah, you're fine. OK, thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Will Manus. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about me. I'm a commercial hot air balloon pilot. I've been involved in ballooning since 1996. I am also a paramedic lieutenant with Albuquerque Fire Rescue, currently assigned at the EMS, as a, in the EMS training division. I'm a CPR, ACLS, and PALS instructor with our, uh, American Heart Association and uh, American Red Cross. So tonight I'm going to be touching on subject Whatever. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to be teaching you guys hands-only CPR. Um, it's 
something, a skill that is very important to know, at, but I hope no one, you never have to use it. It is a potentially life-saving uh, skill. Uh, the more people in the community that know this skill, the better off we will. Um, again, I hope you guys never have to use it. So what is CPR? CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a emergency procedure consisting of chest compressions and artificial ventilations that you perform on somebody who has gone into cardiac arrest or in other words has stopped breathing and their heart is no longer beating. And you do this until further measures can be performed to hopefully get their heart going again. So then what I'm teaching tonight is hands-only CPR. Hands-only CPR is CPR without artificial ventilations. The big difference is for the general public, it's an easier procedure to perform and there's less interruptions while performing or providing that artificial ventilation. Why, why that is important is chest compressions, what you're doing is when the heart's normally beating, it's creating pressure throughout your vascular to help keep your organs, primarily your brain, perfused or oxygenated. Once your heart stops, there's no longer that blood flowing, so that pressure's gone. So what we're doing with compressions is trying to maintain that perfusion pressure. Every time you stop to give a breath, in traditional CPR, you're going to do 30 compressions to two breaths. When you stop for those compression or for the breaths, that pressure drops. And typically what can happen is if you're not trained, you don't do it very often, you take too much time doing that. And while that pr uh, pressure is down, the brain is potentially dying. So even if we do get pulses back with ACLS, advanced care, the, uh, unfortunately the patient's already brain dead or has enough brain damage that they never actually re uh, recover from that cardiac arrest because they're brain dead. So what we're going to do is only hands-only CPR or, or compressions. So, so is it effective? Yes. So artificial ventilation is either providing like mouth to mouth, it's actually providing that breath. So we can either do mouth to mouth or EMS providers, medical providers have uh, what's called a BVM or bag, bag valve mask and we can actually breathe for the patient. So for hands only CPR, we're not doing that. Um, you might ask, is it effective? And it is uh, very much so in certain cases. So the times that you're going to do hands-only CPR are going to be for teenagers or for adults, and I'll touch on that reason why here in a minute. And it's got to be a position or a cause for the cardiac arrest is not a respiratory reason. So um, for an adult who just suddenly collapses because they had a heart attack and now have gone into cardiac arrest, hands-only CPR is going to be ideal for that. Um, I mentioned only on teens and adults. The reason we don't do it on children or somebody who has a respiratory cause for cardiac arrest is because a, children don't typically go into cardiac arrest due to a heart problem. They're young, their hearts are healthy, unless they're born with some sort of defect, they're not gonna go in cardiac arrest because their heart's bad. It's gonna be because of a breathing issue, either asthma, choking, something that caused them to become hypoxic or low oxygen that leads to their heart stopping. Hands-only CPR, um, you, might quite, you might ask why we don't wanna provide the ventilations if it's a, just a, a heart problem. For hands-only CPR, your, your body already has quite a bit of oxygen in that blood. We just need to circulate it to get to, the, to those organs. Also, as you're doing compressions, you're pushing on the, the chest. So you're going to get some passive air movement in and out of the lungs as you do those compressions. Um, so now I'm going to take you through the steps of CPR. It's really simple. There's two steps. You're going to call 911 and you're going to push hard and fast performing chest compressions. 
So once somebody goes down, you see somebody collapse, you're going to approach them, um, identify that they need assistance. You're going to have some, somebody call 911 or you're going to call them yourself. If you're in a crowd, don't just call out, hey, somebody call 911. We like seeing action. We're curious. You say that to a crowd and one person's going to think that the next person's going to call 911 and it's never going to happen. So if you're put in this event or in the situation, you want to point out and actually pick out one person to go call 911. Peter, you go call 911. So now we all know Peter's got that task. He's going to deal with that. Next thing, you're going to expose the chest. You're going to put your hand, uh, the, the position for CPR. You're going to put the palm of one hand, either arm, whichever you want, right in the center of the chest, approximately at the nipple line or at the armpits. You're going to set your other hand directly over your first hand and you're going to push down hard and fast. In a normal situation, we're not going to be doing it on the table. Uh, we'll be on the floor, but just for demonstration purposes. So for compression rate, you want to be at between 100 and 120 beats per minute, with ideal around 110. Yes? Do you mean more to the left or right side? Right in the center of the chest. Yes? For the range, um, so you want to you want to be, yeah, you want to make sure the very bottom of the breastbone is called the xiphoid process. It's cartilage, so you want to be above that because you can potentially break it if you're too low. So you want to be on the center of the the center of the breastbone or the the sternum. Um, if you've had CPR in the past, you may have been told at least 100 compressions a minute. HA recently changed it to give the range of 100 to 120. Ideal range is going to be 110. The reason they put a, a cap or a upper limit is if you get going too fast, when you do compressions, you want to make sure that you recoil or lift up your weight off the chest. Because if you don't do that, the next time you press down, the heart's not going to have time to refill with blood. So the next time you squeeze the heart, there's less blood going out to the body. So your compressions are going to be less effective. So um, who's had CPR classes before? Have you guys heard the song, the, they say to keep the beat, you can do, sing the song in your head, staying alive? There's quite a few other songs that do it well, and if I have time, I'll play a YouTube video for you with it. Another song for the younger generations out there, and just to bug you guys and get in your head, is Baby Shark, is also appropriate beats, <laughs> so. Uh, stick to staying alive. Yeah. <laughs> so to demonstrate, it takes a lot of effort to do the compressions. So this is not, you're not using just your arms. This is a full body uh, procedure that you're going to do. So you want to keep your, arm, your elbows locked, put your shoulders over your hands, and push down with your full, full weight. If anybody's done CPR or practiced CPR, you get really tired out within the two minutes. Um, for adults, for so talked about pushing down, the depth that you want to go is approximately one third the depth of the chest. So for adults, it's going to be approximately two and a half inches. Kids, two inches, and infants or neonates are going to be about inch and a half, but one third the depth of the chest. So we're going to push down at a rate of 100 to 120 times a minute. <laughs> Don't quit your day job. <laughs> if anybody could hear us at home, Anne was singing Baby Shark for us. I'm sure Blair will appreciate that. <laughs> so that's, that's hands-only CPR in a nutshell. Um, mentioned doing it for two minutes. So what we want to do is... <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Peter's getting ready to play Baby Shark for us. So,
Thank you, Dick. Yes. Oh. So every two, every two minutes, we want to do a pulse check. So, and at that point, if you have more than one person there, that's when you want to switch around. Because if you, if, if you go too long, your compressions are going to become ineffective and that won't help save the person. Mike, you had a question? Okay. So, I don't know if... Okay. So, Mike uh, Carpenter wanted me to mention to you guys what might happen on, especially on older population. What he's talking about with compressions is there's a very high probability that you're going to break ribs. Uh, it happens. It is what it is. And if your way to think about it, this person is effectively dead, we're trying to save them. What's worse off, being dead or being alive and dealing with broken ribs? Uh, <laughs> no throwing up on me. I'm trying to save you. And so, and actually, that's not, it doesn't have to be in an elderly. I actually know a balloon crew member who is currently recovering from broken ribs after having CPR on him. So, but I'm sure he's thankful to be alive and dealing with the ribs. Yes? Do you recommend to turn the head and speak in a clear hearing if there's you know, instruction and that kind of thing? So, if. Uh, so, repeat the question. <laughs> So Blair asked if uh, we should s turn the head to sweep to clear any obstructions. I'm going to talk about choking adults, so I'll talk about that in that in that section in just a moment. So in general, like I said, that's CP that's hands only CPR. Uh, call 911, start compressions, 110, 100 to 120 times a minute. Switch every two minutes so that you can st those uh, compressions effective. So compressions, they're going to buy us time. They're going to keep those organs perfused until advanced help can arrive. One, one device for advanced help that is available in quite a few public places is an AED, or an automated external defibrillator. So I'm going to touch on how to use those real quick. And they made them firefighter proof, so the general public should be able to do them as well. Um, at the same time that you send somebody to call 911, pick another person to go get an AED if there's one in the area. Once the AED arrives, you're going to turn it on and you're going to follow the steps. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. So it's saying to apply, apply the pads. Pad connector next to flashing light. Plug in the pads. Apply them to the patient's chest. Plug in connector. And on the pads, Analyzing regardless of the type of uh, AD, it's going to have pictorials on how to do it. Shock advised. As soon as you put the pads on, it's going to analyze. During that time, you're not going to touch the patient. You're going to stay away from him. It's going to determine whether it needs to be shocked. If it does, it'll charge. Make sure no one's touching the patient, shock and shock. Pause. As soon as you shock, immediately start compressions again. It will go through its cycle, and two minutes later, it's going to start the process over with reanalyzing the patient and having you defibrillate if needed. You're going to continue compressions until advanced help EMS arrives, or you're too tired to continue doing compressions. So if they start breathing on their own, check their pulse. If they have a pulse, um, just wait for EMS to arrive. You can stop, the mm -hmm. you can stop compressions. Does that ever happen? Pre-hospital, there's about a 40% survival rate for compressions. Um, typically, you will get pulses back before they start breathing on their own again. But I have had people where they coded in front of me, got, uh, we shocked them once, and within about two minutes they were awake talking. So it does sort of happen based on how the TV shows, but usually they stay unconscious. 
Yes, Mike. Is there adhesive? Yes. <laughs> so you're going to peel them off and stick them onto the chest. Any questions as far as the CPR portion goes? Yes. Last class I had, we were told that the reason we switched to hands only CPR was to avoid contamination even before COVID. Um, is that still the main reason for using hands only? It is. It's definitely one of the reasons. The big reason is per, uh, when you stop to give the breaths, you're stopping the compression so that perfusion pressure drops. But it is also a good thing avoiding potential contamination or not contaminated exposure. Um, and when I won't do mouth to mouth on anybody, and it's not because I'm afraid of the communicable diseases. Once you start pushing on somebody's chest, there's a lot of other nastiness that's gonna come out, out of their mouth. And I don't want that anywhere near my mouth. Yep. So, uh, that's, that is, that's one of the, re that's a secondary reason. So, anybody wanna practice? Come on up. So if you want to show, so come, whoever wants to practice, come up to the mannequin. We have a few more over here. <laughs> so we've had one person, or you've had somebody in front of you collapse. What do you want to do first? Okay, have somebody call 911, specif specify do it. So, a, a very nice tool that you can put on your phone is a metronome. It's gonna keep, give you a beat to stay, stay with that. This is at one, uh, 100. So, make sure you keep your arms straight. Yep. Lock your elbows, wait over it. A little bit faster, Beth. So you have a question, if you're not going fast enough, would that be detrimental or uh, just not effective? It just won't be building enough pressure. Person to what? It's as effective. Um, it prevents that they keep perfusion at a high level, so you're going to be maintaining that so there's a better outcome, chance for outcome and less air, less chance of if you have it, if you delay too long between compression, it's more than about 10 seconds, there's a higher chance of having. Uh, uh, organs that are the brain not being perfused and cell death in the brain. In the brain. So. Well, that's that's those inner those breaks between them. What's the metronome at? One ten to one twenty. Oh, there's 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 a bunch of them. Yeah. So so Peter, what do you think of compressions? Yeah. Okay. So, 
I had a comment asking about. Initially, yes. Eventually, no. You're, you're, as you start breaking the, the ribs, you're gonna get, you're gonna end up with a divot. So I had a few a few questions and comments. One person asked about, uh, I mentioned exposing the chest. It doesn't matter, male, female. The reason we want you to expose the chest is as soon as the AED gets there, we have to be able to apply those pads directly to the chest. If you do that right away, then there's less delay later. Um, also, Ann asked me, is it the body going to always stay where it pops back up, stays kind of like rebounds? That's not going to, after a while with a live patient or a real human, you're actually going to get some indentation as you break the ribs, as you push that tissue down. It's not going to rebound completely as you do compressions. Again, you're, trying, you're working on saving their life, so risk versus benefit. I'd rather have them alive with some other issues than dead. Yes? So the question is, by pushing on the sternum, what's the risk of puncturing the lung? It is there, but as long that's why you're staying, you want to stay up higher on the sternum. If you get off down below that xiphoid process, you could potentially break that off, and that could be in a position to puncture a lung or upper org organ in the upper abdomen. By by pushing on the chest, you're you might break them, but it's going to typically more on the sides. So there's less chance there. And again, would you rather have them alive with something that could be repaired or dead? So, so Peter, what do you think? Sorry. So the, the question was, are you going to feel the breastbone break? Uh, typically, it's not going to be. It's going to be more the ribs, um, and it's a, there's a, there's always a chance of a compound fracture, but it's for, it's slim in that case. Any other questions on CPR? Any in the at home? Correct. So the question was, once the pads are placed, do you have to take them off or remove them to do compressions? No, you'll push right over them. So none of us made it two minutes. We only made it one piece. Switch off every minute? Yeah. You can switch off at whenever you need to if you get tired too quickly. You don't want to go beyond two minutes because you may not re if the younger person may not realize how t they're getting tired and their compressions are going to start to drop off. So you can go so up to two minutes. Yes. So for those at home, so the comment was, as you switch off, you want to make sure you do it as aimless as possible. So you don't want to stop, get out of the way, then somebody else come down. Have them get in position on the other side of the patient. And as soon as you lift off your hands, they're going on and immediately st uh, starting compressions again. So, um, no, uh, so he also mentioned that as you push, as long as you're getting your weight off, you don't have to physically break contact with the patient, but you do want, if you push in two and a half inches, you want to lift up two and a half inches. So you get full recoil. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to bounce on the chest. You just lift up your weight off of it. You had a question in the back? Yes. Initially, yes, um, as you do more. So the question was, uh, compared to doing the pressure needed to do compressions on a mannequin versus a, a real patient, is it going to be similar? 
initially it is as you do compressions you break ribs and stuff it's going to get a little bit less on uh, a real patient so. it gets it'll get so the question was uh will it get, ever get really soft it can after a while after doing compressions 30 40 minutes it does get softer So in my with the with the with the fire fire department we can we'll do, go at least minimum thirty minutes. I've mm -hmm. yeah that's as as being a paramedic doing stuff. So uh, it depends. Um, if you're out by yourself in the middle of nowhere, you're gonna have to make that decision as how long you think you can do effective compressions, um, depending on how long it's gonna take to get medical care. As long as you keep good compressions going, you can keep their organs perfused, their brain perfused for quite a while, but it's maintaining good, high quality compressions is the key. You mentioned checking for a pulse. How would that do So the question is, uh, how, how do we go about checking a pulse? So for hands only CPR, if you don't see that they are, you don't think they're breathing, uh, we're, it's just teach if if you don't see them breathing, we're just teaching immediately jumping on compressions. If you do want to check a pulse on somebody, you're going to check their carotid pulse. So you're going to feel right up underneath the chin, their side of their 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 throat. So if you guys want to check on your on your yourself, it's going to be. It's, you guys feel it? Okay. So you're going to check on the same point on them. The reason we check on the up there at the carotid, not at the radial, is it's closer to the heart. So if they have a pulse, their blood pressure is that's a, the point where you can feel it with their blood pressure the lowest. So so you could feel possibly feel a carotid pulse where you wouldn't feel the radial pulse, which is on the wrist. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I wanted to cover was choking. I, I already did that. So. Um, is, is going to be choking on a, an adult. So have you guys all heard of the Heimlich maneuver or abdominal thrust? So for an adult who is awake and choking, we're going to do the abdominal thrust on them. As you can see on the slide, so what you're going to do, actually Blair, you want to come up and be my, I'm going to demonstrate on you. With, <laughs> with your dominant hand, you're going to create a fist. You're going to put it up underneath the bottom edge of their rib cage and squeeze you're going to squeeze hard and in an upward motion you're going to do that until the object is dislodged or the patient becomes unconscious do they typically spit it out whatever it is oh yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah they definitely could so <laughs> You can do the abdominal thrust on adults or larger kids. Um, once they get the two, three year old and above, you can actually do abdominal thrust on them. You might have to get down to their level to do it. If you're doing it on a, a smaller kid, just make sure that you're not doing it hard enough that you're lifting them up off the ground. I mentioned that you'll do this until they go unconscious. Once they go unconscious, you're gonna lower them to the ground and you're going to start CPR like normal, but the one thing you want to do is occasionally check their airway to see if that object has dislodged. You can reach in, pull it out. Do not do blind finger sweeps. Don't just put your finger there unless you see the object, because what could happen is it might be up a little bit, so it may have cleared the airway, but you, uh, if you can't grab it and see it, you might push it down, lodge it deeper, and re-lodge it, and, uh, or it's going to be harder for it to get out the next time. So that's an adult. For little babies, we're going to do something different. So it's still going to be if they're uh, crying, if they're awake, crying, you're going to do alternating. Uh, next slide. Sorry. So we're going to do alternating back blows and abdominal thrusts. So you're going to be in a sitting position. 
resting your forearm on your knee, the child's head downward, and you're going to forcibly hit on the back of their chest five, or their, on their back five times. It's going to take some force. Don't be afraid to hit them. Again, this is a life-saving measure, so getting a bruise or redness on the back is better, or rather have that than um, somebody choking and then going in cardiac arrest. Did you say you sit down? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ann. So you're going to be sitting down, resting forearm on your le forearm on your leg, and you're going to be forcefully hitting five times. You're going to flip them over, make sure you're supporting their head the entire time, and you're going to do five uh, basically compressions. For this size child, you don't need to do the two hands. You can just do a few fingers. You're going to push five times. Before you flip them back over to do the back blows, you're going to visualize the airway and see if you can see the object, pull it out. Again, no blind finger sweeps. And you're just going to keep repeating this process until the object's dislodged or the child goes unconscious, which at that point you're going to start CPR. So, any, any other questions on this stuff? How does CPR for a baby differ from CPR? So, I mentioned earlier that the hands only CPR is for uh, adults or teenagers who ha don't have any sort of airway issue. For uh, adults with an airway issue, you're going to do 30 to 2. So 30 compressions to 2 breaths. Um, don't want to get in too deep into that type of compressions, but um, for children um, older than one month, you're, if you're by yourself, you're going to do 15 compressions to 2 breaths. And then f uh, if there's, or if, sorry, if you're by yourself, you're going to do 30 to 2 still. If there's more than one rescuer or person doing compressions, for children, you're going to do 15 to 2. 15 breaths, 2 compressions. For little kids, yeah, sorry, 15 compressions, 2 breaths. I apologize. For li in infants or neonates, you're going to do three, br 3 compressions to 1 breath. Again, the reason is, uh, kids breathe faster, and again, we're not, they don't typically code due to bad hearts. That it's going to be bit for the airway issue, so we want to provide more breaths for them. That's why we don't do the hands-only CPR. But is the compression still finger compression, or is it hand compression? So that depends on how large the child is and how large you are. So there's not a specific way you have to do it as long as you're doing effective compressions. So you can do a few different techniques, encircling thumbs. So you support the back with your hands and you push down with your thumbs. You can do two or three fingers, or if on a little bit larger kid, you can trans uh, transition to just a single hand. However you have to do it to do effective compressions. So I, on a, I could do encircling thumbs on a larger child than you or, or even than Anne could. So it just ha however you want to do it to do uh, effective compressions. Any other questions? Uh, for children and for neonates, uh, the AED is going to work the same way. The only difference, which I didn't touch on before, is pad positioning. And all the pads are going to have little pictorials or pictures on how to do it. For adults, you're going to put one in the upper right chest, one in the the lower, uh, the left side. For pediatrics, you're going you're to go front and back. So, front of the chest and on the back. Yes, Will. So, if you're provide, if you're not, if you're doing actual regular CPR and you're providing breaths either mouth to mouth or with the BVM, you do want to open the airway. If you don't suspect any sort of spinal injury, you're going to do a head tilt chin lift. You're going to push down on the forehead, up on the chin. If you suspect any sort of uh, spinal injury, you're going to do what's called a modified jaw thrust. And 
if you guys feel, feel on yourself, the back corner edge of your jaw, you're literally pushing that forward. That's going to help open the airway, lift the tongue up, opening so that the path for airway to get in or air to get in without potentially compromising the spinal injury. Yes, Beth. So you're not, so, the, so Beth had the uh, question, if they're choking, what does it do good to open the air or to give breath? So you're not going to give breath unless you can see that you've actually pulled out, they've dislodged that object. That was just for CPR in general, to open the airway. But you can open the airway to look and see if you can see that object. Any other questions? I am done. Thank you, Will. Um, this is really important information that, like, he says, could save a life someday, so really take it to heart, and um, there are plenty of opportunities, you know, to learn more about it. So go to take a CPR course, first aid. Um, there are plenty of them around that people can uh, take uh, all throughout the year. Thank you, then. Thank you, Will. Peter. Real quick, our next month's speaker is going to be this gentleman right here. I think as you've heard before, he's going to be telling us what's the difference between flying balloons in Oklahoma, Kansas, Midwest, as opposed to flying them here. And believe me, there are some differences, I'm told. Um, so that should be really interesting. You're going to have some videos to show us some, some crash landings and all that. <laughs> um, other than that, we're still looking for a speaker for August. Then we start getting into Fiesta. September will be the... This briefing, I presume, in October will be the wrap-up, and that will get us uh, all the way to November. So um, stay tuned for an August speaker. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's see here. Um, Taylor is not with us tonight. Is anybody here with a report from our secretary? And like I said, uh, we did have at least two new members that we voted on last uh, week at the board meeting. So uh, we are still growing and uh, a lot of activity when it comes to that. Let's see here. Uh, Treasurer Dick Rice, come on up. You want to tell us a story? I'll tell you a story. On your microphone. On the microphone. Oh, on the microphone. It's recorded. Okay, I have to stand on the microphone? Or? Oh, oh, I get it. Okay. Uh, not a lot to say. We are still solvent. Surprise. Okay. We just completed our fiscal year, May 31. Uh, doing good. Both uh, entities are in the black. Both entities have cash. Cash is king. Don't forget that. Okay. Uh, other than that, they will be in the cloud bouncer. Uh, I did forget, but Linda reminded me. <laughs> so I just emailed them to Linda, and she thanked me, so she got them, and the pie charts will be in the cloud bouncer. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, observations, whatever, let me know, okay? I'll be more than happy to attempt to uh, answer them. I don't always answer stuff, but uh, I'll probably figure out a story or two just in the process. Okay. And for those of you who are interested, June 28th, 1957 was the day I left for the Marine Corps. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. All right. Uh, moving along. Community relations, I, got, I don't think Jason is here to, not, oh, we do have a report from Jason uh, via Doug Gant. Yes, you do, don't you? All right, this is a report from Jason, and he says this is going to go out in the cloud bouncer to everybody. 
but he says the Grand Chapter of New Mexico is having their annual fundraiser to provide scholarships to New Mexico students. To help for this, they are looking for a donation of two balloon flights to be raffled. Donations will be solicited and fundraised through October and for flights to be valid through 2023. Uh, it says the Grand Chapter of New Mexico. That's that's all. I don't know what. But I'm just, I'm just. You want to call him up real quick, Peter, on the phone? <laughs> well, and um, playing Baby Shark. <laughs> but anyway, he's got a, a Jerry Satterfield with a phone, couple of phone numbers, and an email. But this is going out in the uh, cloud bouncer for everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder that if you do something in the community uh, that represents ballooning, please report it so that, you know, we can let our membership know all the good things that, that are going on with ballooning uh, here in Albuquerque. So thank you, everybody, for that. Okay, special events. I don't think Chris is here tonight. Was anybody, did anybody get a report from Chris? Okay. Uh, I did get a um, just a report from Peg Bilson uh, for education. Unless uh, Beth, are you going to do something for education? Okay. Uh, Peg's still a little bit under the weather, but I think she's getting better. Yeah, she said it kind of comes and goes. She feels better, and then she doesn't. Uh, so. Uh, the online ground school for both private and commercial are still available. If uh, you want to go to the Quad A website and sign up for that, you can do that at any time. Uh, we do provide a, a few books, but a lot of them are online now. So uh, we'll give you the links for all of that. Um, the online crew course is coming along. We still have a couple of months to finish that up. It's the education committee along with the crew committee working on that, and that is coming along. Um, we're also starting to pull together the, the speakers and the topics for the Fiesta Safety Seminar. Uh, and we've, we've started on that last month. So if anybody has any suggestions, let us know as soon as possible because we're going to finalize things next month. Um, we're also updating the Quad A logbook. So right now it's a pretty basic logbook. We're going to update it so that it follows the practical test standards. Uh, and then once we go to the airman certification standards, we'll update it again. But uh, that may not be until I'm dead. Who knows? It's taken a long time. Um, the youth balloon named Lil that was donated to us several years ago, we haven't been able to do anything with it because we had, we had issues for a while with transferring it to Quad A and then COVID, and so we are just now starting to get to the point where um, Marty Cohn's balloon uh, will be annualed and uh, we'll be starting to check out pilots to use it at events later this year. So if you're interested in that. Uh, pardon me? Oh, it is annualed already. Okay, well then we're a little behind. So it's been annualed and insured, and we're looking for people that that want to fly kids for events. If anybody wants to, there's an application process. There's a whole process to go through to do that. And uh, as usual, we have books on the back table back here in the corner. So if anybody needs uh, books, we still have them in the back. We we don't have we 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 don't sell a lot of them at the at the Quad A meetings. It's mostly the Fiesta seminars and ground schools, but we do have them here monthly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, and, and, you know, just a reminder that, that these guys are the hardest working and they are truly the heart uh, of Quad A when it comes to getting new pilots involved and training them and uh, moving them along in their careers in balloons. Oh, that's true. They are the cash cow. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, flying events. Doug. All right. We had a very successful uh, June event. 
Um, currently, Keith Takash is in first place, Paul Smith in second place, and Al Lowenstein in third place. But Keith is really cranking up and getting out there, so you better get busy, Steve, and get in there, all right? Okay. But as... <laughs> <clears throat> but but as you know, for those of you that showed up in June, obviously we moved. We had a new location out um, out by our west side field, and unfortunately, at some point, we're probably going to lose our west side field. We do have a meeting. Yeah, we do have a meeting coming up um, next week with the mayor and hopefully the director of Parks and Rec for uh, the Rio Rancho City. So our goal is to sit down with them and get a dedicated field that we can have for ballooning. That's the ultimate. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what we used to know is totally gone or not so far? It's gone away. Yep. So, I mean, it's, it's happening. I mean, we've seen it encroach on us here in Albuquerque. Um, obviously, flying from Fiesta, we're experiencing the same thing up in Rio Rancho, and you know we've just got to find a home for ballooning, um, something that we in turn can put sweat uh, equity into ourselves um, with this particular project. So it's going to be a, a big club function and a big commitment in a lot of ways from a lot of people to make this happen. <coughs> uh, the next three months, in July, August, and September, uh, are our lead up to Balloon Fiesta. July and, September, July and September events right now are scheduled out here on Fiesta Field. Obviously, the direction of the, the winds will determine what type of competition we have that day. Um, and then our August event, again, will be up in Rio Rancho, probably up again by the school as we did uh, this particular month. Um, my goal is to try and do as many hare and hounds as we can to get people used to following a balloon, but at the same time with Fiesta Field, if we can fly into the field safely, get everybody to get oriented to the landmarks and see what's happening, you know, that's what we would like to do from that particular standpoint. <clears throat> Again, September is going to be our tune-up for Fiesta, and as I did last year, we're going to have um, in attendance, we're going to have zits, we're going to have some safety officials, and I've made overtures to the New Mexico Search and Rescue along with the Albuquerque um, PD Mounted Horse Patrol to get their horses out there getting used to balloons again. I mean, we're going to schedule, I think, what, 650 balloons, so it's going to be a big crowd. Uh, people need to get back in the swing of things for Fiesta as far as that goes from that standpoint. Not only these people, but our, and us as well. And then lastly, um, pilot registration. Those of you that attend pilot registration know that we are now doing registration through cell phones and this type of register. Um, those of you that have extra crew, I'd appreciate if you've got an extra body that you can bring to me that particular morning and help us, you know, register and sign people in each morning. I'd appreciate that very much. Any questions from anybody? No, we're good. Thank you, Doug. It's a big job doing flying events and uh, Doug's doing it well. Uh, so thank you to Doug for all you, what you're doing. It keeps, keeps the general membership out there and involved. And that's, that's a great thing. Okay, Sue, where's, where, oh, there you are. Come on up, Sue. Crew development. Crew development reporting in. Hello, everyone. Um, I really don't have a report for June. It just did not come together. Um, but depending on what Mr. Gant decides uh, as to what kind of event we're having, then I will be placing out, yeah, <laughs> I'll be uh, placing a crew target out that crews can aim for from their balloons with their pilot. That is the plan for July. So I hope to see as many people out there as possible. Thank you. That's all I have. Throwing the pilot at the target is optional, but it will not get you more points. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, let's see. Karen Converse, Ways and Means. Woohoo. Good evening. Um, so the 2022 annual pins are in, so they're $10. It's a pin and a sticker this year. Um, I have new merch coming, so keep 
your eyes on that. And other than that, that's pretty much all I have. Pretty short and sweet, middle of the summer. So thank you for everyone. I have the pins here tonight. Ooh, yeah, you should see the pins. They're really awesome. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Before we move into uh, other ballooning organizations, I just want to take a moment of personal privilege and uh, recognize Ken Tooley, whose birthday is tomorrow. And uh, thank him. Yeah. <laughs> and thank him for all his efforts. We really appreciate all that he does for us. All right. Um, other ballooning organizations, anybody here from the FAA? No? Um, I, I will say just very quickly, um, Peter and I and let's see here, a few other people have been involved with the FAA in trying to work out what the, the policy is going to be towards balloons in Class C airspace with regard to ADS-B out. So um, Peter and I spent three days last, <clears throat> last week, Monday, no, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And we, so we had meetings, um, they were Zoom meetings um, with people from across the United States um, discussing what the uh, policy should be with regard to balloons in Class C airspace with ADSB out. And so we're a long way from much coming out of that. But at least you can be aware that Quad A, I think, gave appropriate input, input to the FAA with, uh, with regard to what flying is like in Albuquerque uh, and, and what we believe are the next steps that we should uh, take in terms of ADSB out. So it was, I think, an interesting conversation and nice that, that we were included in that. Okay, next, uh, BFA, anybody from Ballooning Federation of America? I do see a representative over there. Do you want to just stand and deliver? For those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm Ron Berman. I've been ballooning uh, 45 years, photographer, commercial pilot, uh, I'm in the process of running for Southwest Region BFA uh, board member. Uh, if you're a BFA board member, I'd appreciate uh, your vote and support. Uh, I think we need uh, with all the craziness uh, with airspace and drones and all that. I think we need a, a local representative, and I'm trying to be the local representative. So, thanks. Thank you, Ron. Good luck. Okay, let's see, next is VFRS. Do we have a representative from Valencia Flying and Retrieval? No, okay. Anybody from Top Gun that wants to talk about the, the latest top? Will, come on up. Everybody know Will Fitzpatrick? Mm, there he is, Top Gun official. So since the last time we guys met uh, at Quad A, we've had two competitions. We had Rio Grande Classic. I don't know if you guys, well, we actually had four, four competitions. Rio Grande Classic, Southwest Region Championship, and the New Mexico State Championship. So um, for the Rio Grande Classic, Rhett Hartzell won first place, Jonathan Wright second, and Christopher Kleiber came in third. Yeah. No, just Chris, his, his son. Yeah. Um, for Southwest Regionals, Red Hartzell came in first, Christopher Cliver came in second, and Keith Tekach came in third. And then for um, the New Mexico State Championship, Keith Tekach took first, Ian Whitling took second, and Natasha Stanky took third. And then for our last competition in June, we had eight pilots that competed. Elisa Talbert took first, Stephen Mezzanzella took uh, second, and Sean Spiker took third. Cool. Thank you, Will. All right, uh, Fiesta. Anybody? Oh, that's right. Our own Ken Tooley is going to fill us in about what's new and what's coming up at, with Fiesta. Yeah, I got all the official dates that are coming up for you. First off, we're only 94 days away. So we're already down in double digits. 
June 3rd, which is two days from now, is the last day to cancel your reservation, your um, application. We're in June. In two days, Jennifer tells me, is the last day to cancel out of Balloon Fiesta. That would be June 30th, two days from now. If you're going to cancel, that's when you um, need to cancel by. Um, additional pilots applications um, have closed. Um, you will get um, notice of approval on July 15th. Hotels, for those people who qualify for a hotel or that kind of housing, you will um, get a notice. Uh, well, everybody's going to get a notice on July 6th, but the actual hotel link will go out on July 13th. Um, we'll be sending out a status message to all the registered pilots on, of all your documents on July 31st, and you will have until August 12th to update all of your documents. Um, if you don't know, we're using the same process um, with Balloon Fiesta to verify your documents, track them, send status messages, as we do for Quad A through our PAD um, system. Um, registration, when we get to that point in late September, will only be on Thursday and Friday, so no Wednesday night. Um, and just some stats, we have 650 primary pilots that have been accepted. We have 175 additional pilot applications. Again, we're going through that uh, process and they'll be notified whether they've been approved by the 15th of July. America's Challenge has nine teams registered. Th there is one French team, two German teams, a Swiss German team, an Austria German team, three US teams, and a US Polish team. So we have a great crowd uh, coming in for America's Challenge. Uh, and again, 94 days. Um, it's getting um, busy at the office. All right. Thank you, Ken. Yep. Uh, anybody here from the Balloon Museum? Oh, Peter's wearing all the hats. I will this one anyway. Yeah. Um, I thought it might be useful to just mention that we have been having this meeting at the Balloon Museum now for eight or nine years, and the agreement we have with the Balloon Museum is that we pay absolutely no rental fee for this room. Normally the rental fee for a night for this room would be several, several thousand, several thousand dollars. Uh, what we do pay is we pay a security fee and a cleanup fee, which comes about $300. So the Balloon Museum is giving us a really good deal. Um, I think they appreciate the fact that we are here. I think in um, we should also respect the Balloon Museum. And uh, there are a couple of... Um, exhibits that I think are worth mentioning right now. One is the exhibit that is ongoing at the Sunport um, in the first two layers. It's pretty cool. It's going to be there through Fiesta. There is a new exhibit that you can probably see is under construction on the first floor that's going to um, review 50 years of Balloon Fiesta. Um, it is a joint effort between AIBF and the museum and um, should be pretty special. It's going to open right around September 15th, September 20th, right before um, the actual fiesta starts. And there are also some other smaller exhibits that are popping up through the museum, one of which is going to um, reflect on Warner Brothers' um, involvement in fiesta, the Roadrunner, uh, Coyote theme, and other critters that have popped in and out of fiesta over the years. So I think the Balloon Museum um, deserves our patronage and um, has been very good to us as Quad A over the years. That's all I got. I would like to suggest that the cleanup fee does not include getting rid of the bodies. So <laughs> Dick, do you know where the bodies are buried? Uh, that was right there? Yeah. Okay. Somebody else has to get rid of the bodies. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Okay, so... Um, the, the very most important next best thing is also Peter, because Peter's going to conduct the raffle. So what do you got for us, Vanna? <laughs> and do we have Vanna White? Oh, Anne's going to. 
All right. So these prizes are all compliments of Will, who brought them, and they are safety related, um, which he has provided for us. The first is a tourniquet pouch and tourniquet, which um, should be used appropriately. Don't use it uh, unless you know how to use a tourniquet. It can cause more damage than good. Um, yeah, we'll let someone pick a number there. All right, the number is, I'll omit the first four, 864. Who wants a tourniquet? <laughs> there we go. Do you need a tourniquet? Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. He's donated this now twice. Eight seven zero. Are you the winner? Yeah. <laughs> we can go for three times. Don't you don't put it around your neck. That's the thing I know about. <laughs> All right, let's try third time lucky here, guys. I'm sorry. So Will has just notified me that the crew development course online, which is in development, is going to include first aid. All right. Very good. Who, 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 who? What's the number? Who is she? Oh, okay. All right. All right. I thought Sue declined to take it. There we go, Sue. Congratulations. Man, I haven't had a hard time. All right. Now this next thing I think is really, really pretty cool. This is a flexible splint. And I actually had occurrence to use one of these one times, but if you have a hard landing and you have an ankle that needs support, if you have an arm that needs support, this thing will wrap around and provide, it can be wrapped long ways or short ways. Um, and it's much better than having to go out and find a choya and get all the spines off a choya and use that as a splint. So, eight, eight, one, all right. Now, were we, were we packaging this with something else? With the triangle bandage, which is this one. Yes, this, okay, there we go. Yes, yes, he gets two, I was trying to figure out. So, um, this is also a triangle bandage, which if you have a broken triangle, you can bandage it up, I guess. What, what is it? Triangle? Oh, the triangle bandage supports the splint. It's, it's the support. Okay. It's crew development course. Okay. Another number, please, Vanna. What do we get? This is an emergency blanket and a pad, a chest pad, a custom medical solutions. Okay, it is compressed gauze, so if you have stuff oozing out of your body that's not supposed to be oozing out of your body, you put this on it and it stops the stuff from oozing out of your body. And an emergency blanket if you're cold, like some people I know are always cold. Now can I have the number, please? 880. 880, that's almost me. 882 is me. 880, okay, we have a winner here. Thank you. These emergency blankets are amazing. They will really keep you warm. Um, good stuff, and don't take up any space in your basket. And we have one more prize before we all get to go home. This is a really cool pouch that you can put all sorts of stuff in, all your safety equipment. It's a Protec TP Series 100 Denier Cordura Durable cu Pouch. And the... 882. Uh, that's me. Let's pick, yeah. another, let's pick another you number. Oh, I could use it, but I feel kind of silly taking it. So. Eight, six, eight? Eight, six, eight. All right. Eight, six. You could use one of those? And you got eight, six, eight? We'll give it to you then. Thank you, folks. Let me just double check and see that you're not cheating. Oh, what do you do? She's a nurse. 
So you got all sorts of stuff you can put in there. What's your name? Julie, I'm Peter. Nice to meet you. What's your phone number? <laughs> I didn't think that was going to work. Okay. I think we're done. Um, that's only a fake. That's not a real one. It, it wouldn't actually shock you. Right. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate your time.